You've no doubt seen a lot of reviews on this by now, so why watch this one? Well, there have been a lot of reviews praising the Apple Studio display, but there's also been many, maybe even more, panning it as an overpriced hunk of junk. But I haven't seen a single video detailing how colossally weird this product is. So I guess that's my job. Buckle up. Now, I will spare you the garrulous unboxing and narcissistic commentary on how this permits me creativity. Let's just immediately get to the data because facts do not waste time. Fact. If you want a currently in production 16 by 9 aspect ratio 5K resolution monitor, you have precisely two and a half options. You've got this, the Apple Studio display. You've got the LG Ultrafine 5K released in 2016, which LG has stated is not discontinued despite the Studio display's existence. And then if you're in the Japanese domestic market, you've got the Iyama ProLite. Uh, it was released in 2018, but it kind of sucks because <laughs> it uses a 6-bit display panel that barely covers the sRGB space. It is not priced nor marketed towards professionals and conversely, not really comparable. Fact, the new Apple Studio display does have improved luminance over the LG Ultrafine 5K. While I do not have the tools to measure peak brightness, our Studio display sustains just over 605 candela per square meter in the center. That is an improvement over our five-year-old Ultrafine's better than advertised performance of 550 nits center brightness. The Studio display is marginally, but absolutely, inarguably brighter. Fact, like the Pro Display XDR that came before it, there are a number of handy factory calibration profiles on the Apple Display, and they're very good. The DCI-P3 profile, for example, is much closer to the DCI-P3 spec when compared to the Ultrafine 5K's luminance adjusted generic profile. With that said, after you calibrate both monitors, the two tend to enter margin of error territory. And while the studio display usually has the leg up, it's very close. Fact, the studio display has a lower delta E value, which suggests less color distortion. The average person can't see below a delta E value of three, but professionals can see errors down to as small as one delta E. So the studio display is looking very excellent in this regard. Fact, a uniformity check in display cal suggests that the studio display is significantly more consistent across the entire screen. Though I do think that our particular studio display is very good. I've seen some ugly looking studio display backlight unevenness online, but even those consider they're beating the 5K Ultrafine pretty much every day of the week. Fact, the Apple Studio Display's panel is laminated to the glass and subsequently has less corner distortion than the LG Ultrafine 5K. The annoying magenta bleed that's visible on the corners of the Ultrafine, I've been bothered by that for years, they're absent in the Studio Display. Additionally, even though my cinematographer gets a little mad about me because he really wants to hate the Studio Display, both my cinematographer and I notice significantly better off-axis viewing on the Apple monitor. If we're strictly talking about the screen and nothing else, the Apple Studio Display is measurably and thus objectively better than the Ultrafine 5K. However, two questions will arise. How perceivable are these differences and do they really make a difference to professionals? Now, my cinematographer suggests that unless pixel peeping, it's rather difficult for him to perceive which panel is brighter when they both have their brightnesses maxed out. I disagree. I think the studio display is clearly brighter to me. However, that's only in a side-by-side -side test from a couple feet away. And if you asked me which panel was which within a few minutes between tests, I would have no idea. It's brighter, but it's not usefully brighter, especially since the Apple panel has no HDR support. On one hand, this is understandable because HDR 600 is kind of a scam but also because the studio display, like the Ultrafine 5K, frustratingly does not support local dimming. This monitor uses the same backlight technology as your iPhone 3GS. Even with just one pixel illuminated, the entire backlight array turns on, making for a lousy HDR experience thanks to a fairly poor contrast ratio. Maybe not by IPS standards, but certainly when compared to OLED and even the new mini LED panels found on the MacBook Pro and iPad Pro. But frankly, even when compared to years old mid-range televisions that have rudimentary edge lit panels. It's an abomination, in my opinion, that a display at this price point capable of getting this bright does not have localized dimming in 2022. I'm not asking for the world, even just a few zones would be better than what we've got right now. 
I do not claim to be an expert. I am not a post-production professional nor cinematographer, but it does lead me to dispelling what I perceive to be a lie Apple has intentionally been feeding us, that perhaps other content creators have relayed without much knowledge. And that's that a panel of this brightness allows for a greater degree of professional creative work. That's just not really true because save for HDR content, display brightness is not just typically unimportant for professionals, but often unwanted. Don't believe me? Netflix Studios requires that color critical standard dynamic range work be mastered on a monitor that is set to a 100 nit peak luminance. That's very dim, but it's because they require you to be in a room that's basically pitch black to ensure the most accurate interpretation of the colors being displayed. In the print world, the large majority of professionals use the Adobe RGB standard, which specifies a maximum peak luminance on your monitor of 160 nits. And many professionals I know and have talked to go as low as 75 nits. Except for when mastering in HDR, many professional content creators do not want 600 nits of brightness. Even Apple says in their display settings that the default studio display profile is strictly for general computing. And it is for this reason that industry standard monitors for SDR creative and color work like the Dell UP2720Q, they don't focus on luminance at all. In fact, they're quite dim. They instead prioritize and indeed measure better than the studio display in their color because they use better 10-bit capable panels. And so the question arises, if this is not really for professionals, then who is it for? And why is it $1,600? Now, I can't fault you for thinking, well, the LG Ultrafine is $1,300, so forgo the crappy plastic in favor of an aluminum chassis, add glass, not objectively offer speakers, and improve webcam with better mics. A $300 premium sounds quite reasonable. But you have to rewind a bit because the Ultrafine was co-developed with Apple and carried in Apple stores. And when the Ultrafine 5K launched in 2016, it sold for a number of months at just $974 before permanently adopting its $1,300 price tag. Now, sure, this might have been promotional pricing, but I don't think that Apple was willing to lose money on each and every unit sale. Like Nintendo, Apple doesn't really discount products over time, it just discontinues them. So just because the six-year-old LG Ultrafine 5K is still $1,300 doesn't mean that the new and improved studio display is a great deal at $1,600. Consider that a new M1 iMac with a slightly smaller 4.5K screen starts at just $1,299, and that includes an entire computer. So I found myself questioning the value of both the LG Ultrafine 5K and the Apple Studio Display. At least, I wasn't until I opened the latter and was shocked to find the most insanely overkill bill of materials. The display assembly is held on with adhesive, very similar to the 27-inch iMacs of yore. And with an adhesive cutting wheel, we can get right in. Now, at first glance, this looks anything but simple. Volumetrically, the largest components are actually the woofer chambers. On each side, there are two force-canceling drivers, which is a trick borrowed from the hi-fi speaker industry to reduce unwanted vibrations. Uh, it's also not the first time Apple has done this in one of their products. And then next to them are the tiniest little tweeters that you've ever seen, one on each side. If you remove those, you're pretty much left with three PCBs serving what seems to be just two functions. On the left, we've got the main power supply board covered in spooky, ouchy, shocky symbols everywhere. <laughs> this thing is insanely thin with the tallest Z-axis components being the copper inductors. Hilariously, it seems that in order to fit the large speakers and cooling assembly, Apple needed to split the power supply into half with the upper right board also being filled with a bunch of capacitors and voltage regulators. The cooling assembly is indeed quite hefty, with two larger diameter blower fans sucking cool air from the bottom of the inlet holes over the main board and power supply boards. Speaking of the main board, it sports, as we know, an A13 Bionic SoC, the same flagship processor used in the iPhone 11 just a couple years ago. In fact, the display actually runs iOS, down to the same iOS 15 build number as the current iPhone release. Oddly, it has been discovered that the display has, get this, 64 gigs of storage. The operating system on the studio display only takes up a mere two gigs, and while some of that spare storage surely allows for uploading uh, firmware to be updated, that's probably a couple extra gigs at most. So then what the heck is all of this spare storage for? 64 gigs? I mean, it's not like it's directly attached to the A13 like the RAM on the M1. So frankly, it's, it's anybody's guess really, but I suspect that the A13 Bionic was simply never designed to operate with less than 64 gigs of storage. 
It's unlikely that Apple just has a warehouse of 64 gig NAND chips sitting around, and even if they did, it likely wouldn't be cost effective to use those over smaller capacity chips. Economies of scale be darned. Weirdness and excess is really the story with this display. It uses expensive power supply components in the name of thinness. A CPU that's faster than all but the latest Snapdragon 888 Android phones, just to run a slightly neat webcam effect. And, well, unconvincing spatial audio tracks. <laughs> it has an unnecessary amount of storage, perhaps even memory too, and even necessitates a custom-designed power plug because there isn't a non-proprietary connector that is thin enough to meet power requirements. Yes, Apple has stated that it isn't removable, but that's a fib, of course. However, carelessly yanking it out very well could damage the retention clip. So Apple has even gone to the effort of designing a special tool just so technicians can remove the cord safely when repairs are needed. But here's a free pro tip. The pellet drum I got from Jim Barry when I was three years old, it works just as well. <laughs> now, despite profligacy being Apple's middle name, even this seems one step too far just to be a screen. This Apple Studio display has been engineered and priced like a computer. It is my strong suspicion that this is our first look at the upcoming Pro-focused iMacs, that this design and component selection will be similar if not the same. Because if that isn't the case, then all of this effort to design this outlandish thing makes absolutely no sense. Because even though the microphones are quite excellent and the sound quality of the drivers are nearly as good as a $30 pair of desktop speakers, and there's a crappy webcam that's allegedly going to get better, it's still a $1,600 single zone 8-bit monitor with performance a stone's throw away from a six-year-old monitor that it's replacing. Now, if you're sitting there blood boiling with your hat spinning and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I need a 5K screen so I can proof my Alexa Mini LF footage and it's aluminum. Well, then this is your only option. And don't get me wrong, this is not a bad screen. It's fine. But Apple has had hit after hit after hit the last couple of years. They've been on a roll, even when it comes to display technology. And this just seems like a miss. It's lazy. Other manufacturers making peasantly 4K resolution monitors have chosen more important things. Newer display technology with addressable lighting zones, better color accuracy, greater peak luminance. Look, if I can have all of those, I'm gonna take it. But at the end of the day, I think those other OEMs have made the right choice. At minimum, in my opinion, and remember, this is a review, reviews are opinion-based, Apple needed to reduce the absurd bill of materials to make the pricing on this good but not great monitor more reasonable. $1,600, despite what Apple has said, in my opinion, has outpriced all but the enthusiasts. Frankly, with what we know about Apple's display technology and given what we've seen from the incredible MacBook Pros, Apple could and should have done more. They could have released a killer display for $2,000 or $2,500, but they sadly took the easy way out instead. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, hit that other button. Doesn't matter anymore. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.